welcome to our October 9, 2012 meeting of East Multnomah County League of Women Voters. This is a very special day because we're all concerned about being informed voters and because Oregon is a vote by mail ballot state, um, we like to get our information clear in our heads and early. So today we're, uh, Susan Foster will present the ballot measures that we will be voting on and she will have lots of good pertinent information. Susan. Thank you, Sonny. I hope I live up to all of that. Um, we have nine state ballot measures, some of which, one of which we're, we're asking people not to vote for. And we have one Gresham measure and one Multnomah County measure in the Gresham district. There are measures, there is a measure in Wood Village. There is, uh, there are three um, <clears throat> charter amendments, charter review amendments in Fairview. We will not discuss those, but we'll move on. I, when I get through with Gresham and I get through with uh, Multnomah County library levy, then we'll go into the state ballot measures and some of them will go fast, I hope. Gresham is ballot measure 26141 and it is an initiative petition and a charter amendment. It is the election of the mayor and councilors. The question that it asks is, shall a Gresham charter be amended to elect the mayor at large and councilors elected and residing in six districts? The question arises, excuse me, the question arises um, because of a charter review recommendation by the review committee that was not accepted by the city council and then filed by initiative petition. They have financial impact, there's none noted, which is the way that it works. Um, so there's no impact to the city the treasury. The um, measure simply asked, do people want to, instead of voting for all city councilors on the council, do they want to vote for them individually in districts? The idea being that presently the councilors are not evenly distributed throughout the city and some feel that some districts or areas of the city are not well represented. And so it would um, ask the voters to make up their mind about whether they want to do this one way or another. And one of the things that there are two organized groups. There is a group of citizens that are in favor and a group of citizens that are against. Those in favor say that the citizens in every neighborhood in Gresham will have a voice. Um, they'll be able to reach their city councilors and the councilors will be able to help solve both district, their individual district and city problems. Councilors will be accountable to the citizens within their individual districts. Citizens know their districts and will be encouraged to run for city council. Their increase, this possibly will give an increase in the ethnic, economic, and demographic density and geographic representation on the council. Those that are not in favor of this believe that at-large elections gives everybody an opportunity to serve the city, elevating the needs of the entire community above competing individual agendas. And with our current system of at-large elections, voters vote for the best six candidates citywide for four-year terms. With districting, your right to vote for all six districts will be sacrificed and your voice will be diminished. It's up to each and individual one of us to decide which way we'd like to see this done. And are there any questions? Okay, that's the Gresham measure. The next measure that I'd want to talk to you about, you've heard a lot about, and I don't know how much you need to know in addition, and that's the, um, sorry, getting used to these, that's the Gresham County Measure, Measure 26143, and this would form a library district. The entire county of Multnomah would be a library district. It says, shall dedicated library district fund Multnomah County library hours, service, 
and the rate is limited to $1.24 per thousand assessed value beginning in 2013. The financial impact, the current temporary levy assesses um, 89 cents per 1,000 assessed value and would be replaced by the permanent $1.24 per thousand. With those properties um, that are currently um, taxed for the general government for less than $10 per 10,000 of real property value, the limit is in place. When you have so many competing values for the tax dollars, compression comes in and you only are able to get so much money per levy regardless of what you're allowed to assess in the allowed measure, you can only assess so many by state law dollars per assessed valuation of a house or a property. And so it's a $10 per 1,000 of real prop market value. The rest are sorted around through the measures. So at times, um, in measure, when this is due to measure five passing in 1990, um, taxes will increase as much as 35 cents per 1,000 if the levy district were to pass, and that brings the value up to the $10 limit. Um, the, the results of the yes vote would mean that the library would receive its taxing funding through a permanent tax base and would no longer be required to get monies from the county's general tax fund or general fund support. A no vote or lack of passage, the library would continue to request funding on um, two or three, I guess they're three to five year levies, and um, they're temporary levies, and they would continue to ask also for support from the county general fund. The measure would create the library district that has the same boundaries as Multnomah County, and um, usually, the library receives about 66.5% um, of its funding from temporary three to five year tax levies and 28% from, 26%, uh, excuse me, from Multnomah County General Fund and 7.5% from other um, uh, sources of income. The library district permanent rate would be limited to the $1.24 per thousand and this is assessed property value and cannot change. Um, so, questions? It depends. Yes, ma'am. So by voting for the, the district, time, for the district, would this take away from the other? Uh, well, um, there is a possibility that it would, um, they'll come up with a, uh, with a procession, assess, and the evaluation of percentages per all the levies that go into that tax evaluation. And as I understand it, um, it um, the difference between the temporary levy and the tax district, which is partly what you're asking, I think, is that um, the current temporary levy, the library has to go to the voters every three to five years, and as a permanent, it has to not go but once and not go back to the voters. Um, temporary levies are subjected to compression. More, co more are subject to compression than is the permanent levy. So state law um, caps local government non-school taxes, except capital bonds at the $10 for 1,000 real market value. Um, when the property values in a taxing district are not enough to support all of the taxes that have been approved by voters, again, the amounts are re received by the taxing bodies are reduced based on a complex, and I can't give it to you, formula that um, hits property temporary levies much harder than permanent districts or permanent levies. And I don't know that that helps you any except that Multnomah County's permanent tax collection in the year 2011-2012 was reduced by less than 4%, while the library tax collection on its temporary levy was reduced by 32% to give you some kind of evaluation of possibilities between permanent and temporary levy. 
And it would also, um, the permanent levy would also free up county funds for uh, support for county general fund things. Is that clear? <laughs> Anything else? Makes good sense, I think, to um, ask those questions. The other things that we have to deal with in the ballot to, in terms of measures this year are the state le levies and our sta state ballot measures, and there are nine. Um, the first one that's listed is ballot measure 77. It does one thing that some, the league sometimes is not in favor of doing, and that is amend the Constitution. When you amend the Constitution and put things into the Constitution, it takes a two-thirds vote of the entire legislature to remove it, which means things are rarely ever removed from the Constitution once they're put in. But there are some things that may possibly be valid to amend the Constitution to accomplish. Measure 77 is the catastrophic disaster would, would require, by law, a legislative session, and it authorizes suspending the specified constitutional spending restrictions, and it says that the legislature can meet other than in the Capitol building, which is what they are now required to meet in order to do their business. There is no plan now. There's nothing in our Constitution that specifies what the legislature and government will do in a disastrous situation. Um, without a plan, it's likely that the military would be in charge of the state after a disaster, earthquake, tsunami, volcanic eruption, any number of other things. It passed the House 49 to 7 and the Senate 28 to 0. There is, it says there's no financial cost, but that's indeterminate. The costs would occur after a disaster and would come, probably come from all kinds of funding sources, federal, general funds, and others. A yes vote would change the Constitution, a no vote would have the Constitution say the same, and it would not be put in. People are, that are for this um, say that we do need a plan. Those that are against it, we don't need a plan, just call a, a special session. One of the things it also says in this plan is that it would take a two-thirds votes of the legislature, in this case, of those able to get to the legislative session or by phone, call, participate. Otherwise, it would be a two-thirds majority of all the legislature, some not being able to get there, which would make it difficult to do. It's updated because there was a risk assessment in the state that um, changed the predictions of some catastrophic event from sometime in the future 200 years to sometime in the potential um, 50 years in front of us. So they assume that this, there's something coming and the way the cloth, the um, plates are moving together along the coast, the continental plates and a few other things, things are happening worldwide. Tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and other kinds of other things. Any question? Then the uh, next one is um, ballot measure um, 78. And this again is things like, it changes the constitution, but it's housekeeping, wordsmithing, um, it's referred to the um, voters by the legislature, so it's a referendum, not an initiative. And it passed the House with a vote of 49 to 7 and the Senate 28 to 0. Um, a yes vote would change some of the words that would reflect our current usage as opposed to the original usage from the 1800s, and a no vote would say it would stay the same. Some examples of changes as we refer things in the original Constitution as the departments of government, we now refer to the three branches of government, changing words, department to branch. It would change the present usage of branch, which we have in the Constitution, but we use it for chambers in which when we grant powers to either house of, house of the legislature. Simple word changes but have different meanings from what they used to have in the original usage. It also directs the constitutional change of gender neutral words in, in referring to the Secretary of State because our last three Secretaries of State have been women. In the Constitution it refers to he, him, hers, his, and they would replace those with gender neutral, gender neutral words. 
So up to you folks. Any questions? These are, again, con two constitutional amendments, and, and you need to determine whether these are things that you um, can live with or not, and what, that we need to worry about changing again in the future. Um, the next set of ballot measures, I have no idea which ones are most important to you. Do you have some you feel you'd like to consider more than others? Well, okay, here we go. The next one is ballot measure 79, which is the ban on real estate transfer taxes. This was placed on the ballot again by initiative petition. The financial impact is stated to be none on state and local government expenditures or revenue. No new funds would be raised if the ban became permanent. There is already a legislative ban in place, um, statutory ban in place, and the current existing fee in Washington County, they've had one since I think 1977, would be grandfathered in by the proposal. In fact, if there were any real estate transfer taxes in existence, if they occurred prior to December 31st, 1999, they would simply be grandfathered in. A yes vote would pass, uh, if it passes, the state and local governments would be prohibited from imposing taxes and fees um, or assessments on the sale of tra or trans sale of transfer of any interest of real property, except those again, like I said, in operation to in the end of 1999. A no vote would say the current law would remain unchanged, which prohibits local government from imposing real estate tax transfer taxes or fees, with exceptions. Um, it allows the state legislature to impose such taxes or fees with a three-quarter majority, sorry, three-fifths majority vote. Um, a real estate transfer tax is a tax that may be imposed uh, by states, counties, or municipalities on the transfer of real property within a jurisdiction. Um, it occurs in some 37 states in the District of Columbia at the present time. The range in the amount of tax is from uh, one-tenth of one percent in Colorado to I believe the highest is four percent in Pittsburgh. In most cases, there are exceptions for certain types of buyers based on buying status or their income level, meaning that it would not impact, supposedly would not impact, low-income buyers and low-priced um, low housing, affordable housing. In the 2005 data from the National Conference of State Legislatures, as I said, they determined that 37 states have some form of transfer tax, real estate transfer tax. They vary from place to place. In 1977, we had a statewide transfer tax and the proceeds dedicated to affordable housing and infrastructure development. It failed. <laughs> In 1999, big jump there, the legislature passed the existing statutory ban, it's in state statute, not in the Constitution, on lo state, local, state, and governments putting transfer taxes on real property. The connection between the real estate transfer tax and affordable housing came about through a the 2003-2005 Blue Regional Blue Ribbon Committee um, reported that local government and private partners made up of par local government and private partners reviewed the um, need to support programs for affordable housing in the Port Me Portland metro region, region. It stated that the need was increasing um, due to high unemployment rates, um, rising house causes, housing costs, and increasingly increasing homelessness. The federal role in financing also through this same period of time has been declining um, for financing affordable housing. So less and less becomes available from the, from the federal government. So it increases the need for some local nee means to pick up the cost of developing affordable housing. Um, committee recommended that the fee be small. Um, less than 1% of the sales price um, applies only to residential properties and is designed to minimize the impact on lower priced housing by exempting lower priced houses. Um, questions? 
a yes vote would say continue the ban, a no vote would um, change the ban. Okay. <laughs> these are, as I thought these things would be fairly straightforward. Um, we shall see. Measure 80. <laughs> Legalization of marijuana. And the official title is it allows personal marijuana, hemp cultivation and use without license, and creating a commission to regulate commercial cultivation and sale of marijuana. It's a statutory amendment that's placed in on the ballot by initiative petition. Financial impact of this could be quite a lot or not. It's the, the cost of operating the commission that would be formed, the Oregon Cannabis Commission, would be similar to the cost of maintaining the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, at least this is an estimation, of approximately $22 million per year. The total revenues to the state government are also indeterminate because the revenues from taxation and sale of marijuana are likely to be sufficient to offset the expenditures of the commission so that might be uh, revenue neutral. But it's not yet determined the number and difficulty of federal challenges to the Oregon law, making the potential financial impact unpredictable. It's possible that it would cost between $1.6 and $3.3 million per year for the court cases that would ensue because federally it is illegal what they're asking Oregonians to pass within the state. The impact on local law enforcement, district attorneys, and courts is also indeterminate because they would be required to act should this law pass. If you vote yes, and if it passes, it will replace all existing state and local laws relating to marijuana, except medical marijuana, and, it and also driving under the influence of intoxicants. In this case, marijuana is considered an intoxicant, and DUII um, warrants under when you're under the influence of marijuana would still be in place. Personal use and um, cultivation of marijuana would be permitted. Marijuana would be regulated and sold in state licensed stores and it would be taxed similar to liquor. So we'd have marijuana stores and liquor stores the federal law prohibiting the cultivation, use, sale of marijuana would remain in place and likely would to result in conflict over the law. If the vote is no, then the measure fails and all the existing laws remain. In 1935, marijuana was legal in Oregon and many other states. In 1973, Oregon de decriminalized small amounts of marijuana, as in possession of under one ounce. It was a misdemeanor, became a misdemeanor. In 1986, voters defeated a measure similar to this one we're being asked to look at, which would have made marijuana cultivation and use legal. In 2010, a measure defeating that tax, that would allow marijuana medical marijuana dispensaries, and they are appearing in some places. Hemp is one of the strains of cannabis sativa, which is the name for marijuana, and it is a strain that has less than 0.3% of the THC, the psychoactive component that's found in marijuana, so theoretically not being then an intoxicant. Uh, cultivation of industrial hemp, which has incredibly long fibers and is very good in any fibrous production, um, clothing, rope, um, purses, any number of things, are being made out of hemp in some places. And should the um, federal law change, it would permit cultivation of industrial hemp. This bill asks that they says that there would be no restrictions in the state for cultivation of hemp if this bill passes. It would amend the state law to allow the growth, the use, and possession of marijuana in Oregon. The Oregon Canna Cannabis Commission 
would be set up to license qualified marijuana growers, license processors and packagers, license stores to sell marijuana, set standards, and establish retail prices for marijuana and collect the fees. As it stands now, the person must be over 21 and have no convictions for selling marijuana to minors to be involved in marijuana cultivation, etc. It also, as I said, allows industrial production of hemp without any state restrictions. Revenues are from this would be distributed following a pattern after you reimburse the commission for its expenses and the attorney general's office for the cost of enforcing and defending the measure, which then the, the measure they would be required to do. After the licensed retailers are paid 15% of their gross sales, the remainder of the monies would go 90% to the state general fund, 7% to fund drug treatment, 1% to create and fund a committee to promote Oregon grown hemp fiber, 1% to create and fund committee to develop and promote biodiesel from hemp seeds, and 1% to state school districts for drug education programs. And again, as I said, it would require the Attorney General to defend the law in federal courts and to defend Oregon citizens from federal prosecution. The supporters say that like litter, litter, excuse me, liquor, sorry, cannabis, would be the only, only sold to adults who are over 21 and older. You'd keep all your DUII laws, so driving under the influence would still allow you to be um, arrested. The growth and sale of cannabis would be regulated and therefore it would diminish the black market. The, it would generate revenue for the state while reducing the amount spent on law enforcement and prisons and again, the, it would allow the industrial production of hemp without state regulation, and it would create jobs in the cannabis industry. The opponents tell you then that while youth won't be able to legally purchase marijuana, the increased availability could mean and should may mean that like alcohol, they will have access, which may lead to drug abuse. Passing this would create a legal nightmare for Oregon since federal laws would still prohibit marijuana and they will have to use state resources to um, defend the law and citizens. Any increase, and this is the people against, any increases in revenues are not worth the impact on youth and communities from the legalization and increased access. If passed, drug cartels could monopolize the market. Uh, they could in decrease the public safety and increase law enforcement costs and it would undermine public health and safety in Oregon. Any questions? Is there a number? A, uh, it's uh, 80, it's, it's 80, measure 80. Did you say it would or wouldn't affect the medical marijuana laws? It would not affect the medical marijuana laws. We would still be having the medical marijuana availability that we now have in the state. Um, Measure 81 is bans commercial gillnet fishing on the lower Columbia. The proponents for who put the initiative up, the governor, like I said, the sponsors of the bill, the fishing communities, the fish and wildlife agencies are asking that people not pass this bill because it will not solve the problem. Without an agreement with Washington, which the state Oregon Fish and Wildlife and Washington Fish and Wildlife are meeting to talk hammer out an, an agreement, um, the Washington gill netters would still have access to all the fish. It would just take the Oregon gill netters off the mainstream of the Columbia. The governor is working with the Fish and Wildlife to set aside areas in the bays, in the entry bays from the ocean to the Columbia, um, access areas where there are large numbers of hatchery fish to be available and gill netters would have access to that whereas in the mainstream flow it would be restricted to fishermen. So they're asking that um, people not vote for this bill and give a chance for negotiation and good thinking to... Who's promoting this? The, the, promoting this fisherman. 
sports fishermen, excuse me, sports fishermen, not the gill netters, not commercial, sports fishermen. Oh, 82 and 83. These are the casino bills. Have you had enough of those? Would you like to hear some more? <laughs> you want some more? Okay. <laughs> 82 is again a constitutional amendment that allows a privately owned casinos, plural, it would authorize the establishment of privately owned casinos, mandate percentages of revenues payable to a dedicated state fund. It was placed on the ballot by initiative petition. The financial impact is stated to be in, indeterminate, um, although there are some pop impacts that I will talk about. There will certainly be impacts possible on the state lottery, on tribal casinos, on certain local government entities that receive revenues from tribal go casinos, primarily nonprofits. Uh, small businesses with lottery access could be affected. If you vote yes, then and measure 82 passes, it would amend the constitution to authorize the voters of the state and the host city to approve privately owned casinos. It would require that such casinos give 25% of the month monthly adjusted gross revenues to state lottery for specific purposes. If measure, if you voted no on measure 82 and it failed, the current law, which does not allow privately owned casinos within the state, would remain in force. Supporters say that the job, this would create no, uh, needed jobs and provide economic development. Oregon voters should allow non-tribal casinos so that the state can benefit um, economically because they have determined that they are the only tax-paying um, casino. But it doesn't describe or talk about the large tax breaks they would be given to put the casino in. Privately owned casinos will give 25% of their adjusted gross revenue um, to important public needs such as education, local governments, and law enforcement. To minimize competition with tribal casinos, public, privately owned casinos would only be allowed in cities and no closer than 60 miles from an existing tribal casino. The no closer than 60 miles in from an existing tribal casino is already in the law that we have on hand. The opponents to this bill state that it would change the Constitution and open the door for unlimited casinos to be um, built across Oregon. The Oregon law enforcement is already overburdened and understaffed. And if a privately owned casino is built, there would be more crime, alcohol, and drug abuse. It could harm Oregon's Indian tribes' efforts to strengthen their communities provide jobs in rural areas, and support charities and nonprofits across the state. Um, oh, there you are. Any questions? Is there a stance by the law enforcement agencies on this bill? There is a stand by law enforcement agencies. They are not in favor. The three, go four governors came out this morning not in favor, asking people not to vote for the casino. Vic Atia, Governor Atia, Governor Roberts, Governor Kulangoski, and I believe also Governor Kitzhaber. Measure 83 is a companion to this, and it allows a casino to be built in Wood Village at the former Multnomah uh, Greyhound. Um, park. It's placed, uh, it is a statute, not a con uh, con constitutional amendment, and it's placed on the ballot by initiative petition. Again, the um, financial impact is said to be de indeterminate, but in reality, there is considerable um, financial impact, and I'd like to mention some of that to you. If the casino is constructed, it's estimated that the Oregon State Lottery 
could receive between 32 million and 54 million in net additional revenues per year for public purposes. The estimate depends upon some assumptions, including a 300 million investment in the casino property by the proposed developers, as well as 2,200 um, slot machines and 100 gaming tables, or table games, which you choose. The proposed casino could have indirect impacts on state and local government revenues and expenditures, many of which cannot be accurately determined at this time or predicted. New jobs at the casino could generate income tax revenue, but tax revenue could be lost as a result of the losses in video lottery retailers in the area and the loss of jobs in entertainment and other businesses affected by the shift in consumer spending decisions. Property tax revenues in the area could increase, cost increases to, for public safety and infrastructure could be offset by casino revenues. If the casino is built, Oregon lottery revenues are projected to decline between 61 and 78 million per year because some of the monies spent playing lottery machines may be spent gaming at the new casino instead. It would be a shift again in users where they choose to do their gambling. Because 65% of these video lottery revenues are transferred to state and local governments, state and local government revenues are projected to decline between 40 and um, 51 million when the casino is fully operational. This decline could be offset by up to 83 to 94 million in new lottery revenues from the casino, producing a net gain of between 32 and 54 million. Any questions? The lottery distribution monies, um, when it's, the revenue is determined after the fact, after the adjusted gross um, revenue is determined, um, it, the, it about the, the 25 percent that's given to the state, 80 percent goes to the Oregon Lottery for current distribution. 58 percent of which, and out of that 80 percent, 58 percent goes to education. 4% to local government, and the remainder for other public purposes. The remaining 20 cents percent would be distributed 75% to local government, 15% to tribal governments, and 5% each to the Oregon State Police and Problem Gambling Treatment Fund. Supporters say that the 3,000 temporary construction jobs and 2,000 permanent jobs with benefits could be a positive economic impact in the area. It provides money to give back to Oregon Lottery and benefit state and local governments. It's the first taxpaying casino in the state. They're paying gambling, property, income, hospitality, TriMet, taxes, and could generate much needed funds for schools. New entertainment options at Wood Village could attract tourists and bring in out-of-state dollars to Oregon. Opponents say that it could negatively impact jobs and small businesses in the current um, video, video lottery games, as I said already. Um, most of the revenues generated in the Portland area uh, are generated in the Portland area. The casino would reduce these revenues, which are important to funding across the state. Because tribal casinos are a major source of jobs and revenue. The Portland Kim Casino or Portland Area Casino could reduce revenues to the tribes near Portland. Any questions? Yes? Did you say some of the revenues would be going to the tribal? Yes. A portion of the, a portion of the remaining 20% of the, <laughs> this is good, I love this, of the 25%, 80% goes to um, lottery funds, education, et cetera of the remaining 20% of the 25% uh, would be 75 to local, I mean, it's too many percents, but 
20% of the remaining 25% would go 75% to local government, 15% to tribal casinos, and 5% each to Oregon State Police and um, Problem Gambling Treatment Fund. Also, do both of these measures have to pass for Wood Village to be able to do it, or just one? Both. One would change the Constitution to allow, excuse me, to allow a, a uh, casino to be, privately owned casino to be built. That's 82. 83 is specific to the casino at Wood Village. And in light of that, Wood Village has a, a measure on the ballot that um, asks them to vote, as the state constitution already says they should. If they're a host city, they can vote yes or no whether they wish to allow the casino in the city. And as I understand that, if these both were to pass and Wood Village voted no, that should be the end of the process. No, who knows how Wood Village will vote. Interesting. But it does say that already in the Constitution. So we have two left, folks, 84 and 85. And then we're done. 84 is the estate tax phase out. Phases out existing inheritance taxes on large estates and all taxes on intra-family property transfers. Um, the statutory amendment by initiative petition. The financial impact would reduce state revenues by approximately 17 million in um, 2013 to 2014. That's by 25 percent. 43 million in 2014-15, which is a 50 percent reduction. 72 million in fiscal 25, 2015 and 16, 75 percent. And thereafter, in the fourth set of years beyond, the measure would up reduce by uh, approximately 120 million a year, which is a 100 percent reduction or would not exist anymore. Those in favor say an estate tax is unfair because it's a double tax. People pay taxes during their lifetime. A state tax on the value, a state is a tax on the value of the estate at the death of the person. Taxes are detrimental to farms and other small family owned businesses. Sometimes they force a sale of the business in order to pay the taxes. Doing away with the estate tax and property transfers would sustain family businesses and could create jobs. Those against the measure say abolishing taxes on sales of property within a family could put at risk a large portion of Oregon's revenue from capital gains taxes at the time when public services are badly underfunded. Oregon law already exempts all but very large family farms and other businesses greater than a million dollars in value from the estate tax. Abolishing the tax would provide a tax break to people with estates over one million dollars and after 2016 would result in a hundred million, hundred twenty million dollar loss per year. Questions? Doesn't affect me. <laughs> Ballot measure 85 amends the Constitution. Allocates the corporate income excise tax known as the kicker refund. Uh, and refunds that money to the additional fund for K through 12 public education. It's a constitutional amendment by initiative petition. Fiscally, it's indeterminate again because it's effect by unknown future events. If the corporate tax receipts, depending on what corporations do in their income, if the corporate tax receipts exceed the state forecast by greater than 2% or more for a two-year budget period beginning July 2013, the amount would be retained in the state general fund and not kicked back to corporations. In the last 10 budget periods, the corporate kicker was triggered five times. The legislature suspended two of those times and refunds of a between 101 million and 203 million were made the other three times. If you vote yes, the corporate kicker would go to the general fund dedicated to K through 12 education. If you vote no, it stays the same as it is now. 
One of the things that occurs with this is what happens to it once it's in the general fund. The legislature has control of how money is spent in the, in the general fund. And it sounds really good to have it go to K through 12, but it depends on how it's distributed by the legislature. Any questions? Guess what? We're done. No questions on these. Well, thank you. That's very nice. Oh, thank you. Oh.